sometimes the maps that are the prettiest in terms of color are the ones you really have to worry about. And such is the case tonight as we have uh, continue to have elevated risk for EF2 to EF5 tornadoes in the Ohio and Tennessee Valley down into the deep south. A major storm coming in in the east. We've got all sorts of watches and warnings from flood watches to high wind warnings to winter storm warnings and who knows what else. Well, we do because we're here on tonight's Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast, which is brought to you by Tempest by Weatherflow. Get the revolutionary Tempest weather system. Join the fastest growing observing weather network on the planet. The link is on the descriptor to this live stream. Use the coupon code WINTER2324 because it's kind of still going on. Um, if you do, you'll get 10% off. Yes. I got to 77 degrees today. Oh, go ahead. And, and with not a lot of sun either, which was, we had a lot of clouds into early afternoon. And then the sun sort of peered through. And now I'm getting the wind ahead of the cold front and waiting to see what's What's in store for me here in North Georgia? Because I'm in the five to ten percent tornado risk range, so I'll be curious to see what happens during the overnight when this front comes through. But Mr. Mr. Ruben Fairchild has just put up a note saying, "Would you please do exclusive uh, tornado coverage if your house is getting raked by tornadoes tomorrow?" <laughs> well, okay, I'll I'll go on the roof <laughs> if there's if I still have one. <laughs> Actually. Uh, because of the mountains here, weather, you know, the weather does really strange things. You know, thunderstorms uh, bypass you sometimes and then not in others, but uh, we'll see what happens during the overnight. I'll probably will get a thunderstorm where the thunder will shake the house like it usually does. But anyway, we've got a, uh, you know, this is a, a, a very interesting early spring storm system that is producing. Uh, Everything you could imagine uh, with regards to um, uh, possible outcomes. You got flood watches, you've got high wind watches, high wind warnings, wind advisories. And we also have one of those, Joe, we've got another one of these. You know, does Up did Upton talk to Mount Holly today? I don't know. Because well, there's this discrepancy or Well, I'll I'll show you. Let's go let me bring up the um I'll bring up the warning map. Okay, uh, which I did one, you know, that was tight for uh, my weather in a minute video. And here's here's what here's the situation. So I, I just thought this was kind of strange. Anyway, so they've got they've got a high wind warning up for Monmouth County. Okay. They do not have a high wind warning up for Ocean County. All right. I can I can understand that. So they have wind advisories for Ocean County and Point South. But they have a high wind warning in Monmouth County. That is Mount Holly's bailiwick. Now we go to Upton's bailiwick, which is New York City, Long Island, and, and you know, southern New England. So they have a high wind watch from New York City and Long Island. So, I, you know, just you've got high wind warnings up for one county. Uh, in and then you go sit to the south, it's a wind advisory. But then you go to the north and northeast and it's a high wind watch. So I I don't know. Did they did they talk? I, I, I'm not sure if they did or they didn't. Um we also have uh wind advisories up, you know, basically high wind and coastal flooding uh is gonna be a problem from southeastern New England all the way down to the Delaware coast. Uh, we've got flood watches up for New Jersey. We have flood watches now up for Long Island. That's another thing they didn't have earlier. And now I just saw that they put flood watches up. So now they got flood watches up for Long Island. And I think um, I'll go to the wider map. No, they didn't put them up for you in the Hudson Valley. Well, um, <laughs> I, you know, I need to have this explained to me. I just do. And I was just going to say, I mean, like, I wish I knew the criteria from one state to another or one county to another for what advisory should be up and what 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 warning or what should be up. It is very, very confusing that. And you know what? What's what's really frustrating is didn't they go like two or even three years ago? They said that they were going to go through some kind of renewal 
of, uh, of of advisories and headlines and whatever like that. Whatever happened to that? It seems like we've got the same old story that we've had for all of these years. Nothing has really changed except we still have the same confusion. Yeah, I, it, it, it's, it's, well, I, I just, I, I, I find myself trying to outguess them, you know? Yeah. And then, of course, then, of course, there's the timing of when they, they send out their updates because, you know, nine times out of ten, I'll wait till about four o'clock and then if I'm doing something and then I'll do it. And, of course, the minute I do it, some you know one of the offices decided oh we're we're not sending anything out till 4 30 and then it changes everything but anyway i'm complaining too much what i what i also find interesting is that you know they have like storm warnings up on long island sound of all places uh from uh six o'clock tomorrow morning until two o'clock in the morning on thursday and you know there was a time when a storm warning a storm warning was only issued in the most extreme case and you know I'm wondering if this really is an extreme case. I, I could see a gale warning, but storm warning? I don't know. Well, you know, depending on this, how the low redevelops and with everything else that's going on, there's a, you know, as one of the regulars on my uh, subscription uh, site, Mike Bologna, pointed out that there's a screaming jet at 925 millibars. Screaming! A screaming <laughs> jet coming in from the east. Uh, so, you know, if that, if you, if you assume that all that, the, the, that, that mixes down, I suppose the storm warning is, is, is justified. I, I you know, it's been used. It, it was very rare to see it when you and I were, you know, you know, in our younger days, but there's, you know, in the last 20 years, it seems to be getting used more and more. And we do have yeah. that. The storm warnings up for the South shore of Long Island. Also, down to Monmouth County in New Jersey is a storm warning, but to the south, it's a gale warning, right? just to be clear. Uh, and the storm warning goes all the way up through southeastern New England, all the way up through the coast of Maine. Winter storm warnings up for all of Maine except the northernmost counties, all of New Hampshire, all of Vermont, northeastern New York. Uh, they got a little shadow effect there near the Vermont border, border where they just have advisories up, and then it goes back to warnings. And that's the topography and the fact that this is elevation driven and you've got winter st- winter weather advice well they wore winter storm watches i think they mean did they go to hold on i gotta check this joe because it looks <laughs> like some of these counties are advisories in north central new york and a couple of them are still winter storm watches they still have the winter storm watch up for the catskills i guess they decided you know not to make a decision tonight and wait to see how this plays out tomorrow flood watches for southern and southwestern new york Flood watches that go back to Ohio and to southern Indiana. Red boxes you see in southeast Ohio, that's all flash flood warnings. And the yellow, uh, those are tornado watches that are up from southern uh, the southern half of Ohio and southwestern Pennsylvania, half of West, West Virginia, most of Kentucky and Tennessee, and then a sliver in northwest Alabama and northeastern Mississippi. Uh, so it's very, very busy from that standpoint. Winter storm warnings, so uh, except for the northwestern uh, part of Wisconsin, for the most part, is not in it. But everywhere else, in the, most most other places in Wisconsin are either under a winter storm warning or an advisory. We have two counties on the upper peninsula of Michigan under a blizzard warning with storm warnings in Lake Superior, uh, in effect, and also for a small area in Lake Huron uh, on the northeastern uh, uh, northeastern corner of Michigan offshore there, they've got a little patch of purple uh, indicating a storm warning there. The West is pretty quiet, so we won't have to worry too much about them. Wind advisories up in Florida, uh, up in, you know, on, on, the, uh, on the peninsula, not on the panhandle. Some wind advisories in central South Carolina, some wind advisories in the upper Mississippi Valley. So we have a lot going on tonight, folks. Welcome to everybody on the chat board. And to those of you lurking in the background, welcome to tonight's Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast. If you like the show, hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss us. Regular schedules are Sunday through Thursday at 7.35 p.m. But we've been doing schedule changes because Joe has been doing a lot of eclipse work. So we're on normal time tonight, which hasn't happened in a while. And um, tomorrow... We're on at what time? Eight thirty. That's the last one. The last time uh, one of my library talks will impact Joe and Joe. After that, it's all Joe and Joe at the same seven thirty-five time until uh, whenever. 
Yes. So, um, Vincent Croce, my Easter dinner turned out to be fantastic. We'll discuss that later. Um, in the meantime, Mr. Rayo, uh, yes. if, if you if you would, uh, let's go on a rate. Uh, you, you do the radars, and what I will do is I will monitor Tornado HQ and see if there are any warnings going on when you hit those um, those radar zones, okay? Well, of course, the first thing you must do is open the share. Is open the share, yes. Correct. So we're going to do that. And it's done. So you're all set to go. Johnny Quest, thank you for hitting uh, the tip jar tonight. Most appreciated. Uh, I will have, yes, you will have everything from rain and storms to snow. Uh, actually, we're going to talk, you know, the snow, actually, there might be some accumulating snow down the Appalachians with this, which is going to be kind of, kind of fun. I might even be may even see a few snow flurries out of this. Everybody here is everybody here is talking about dogwood winter uh, because that's when the dogwood trees are all in bloom and then the weather turns cold. So you know this whole second winter concept uh, is in play here in North Georgia. And Barry Goldberg, thank you for hitting uh, the tip jar tonight and for informing us that the Mets are in a rain delay at City Field. Obviously, no one there watches. Joe and Joe. Are they correct? They don't. The Mets, so, are having, the Mets are having a great season, by the way. What, they're 1-0? 1-0. They're 0-4. They're 0-4. Oh, my God. It oh, shows you how much oh, I pay attention. And my sister, Lisa, and I wonder how many people who are Met fans on the chat board will uh, agree with her or not agree with her. She wrote on uh, some New York Met fan page yesterday, isn't it enough that the Mets are doing badly? Why do they have to continue with this nonsense with the trumpets and the flashing lights when Diaz, the uh, big relief pitcher, comes in? I mean, like, it, it, do it when the Mets are on a winning streak. Don't do it. It looks so stupid, so foolish when the Mets are 0 and 4 and they haven't done anything and haven't gotten away with anything. And she said that she has gotten a raft of uh, poo poo from all different sources, from people saying, you know, why, why do you have to put that up on the, on the, uh, on the uh, uh that kind of message up what are you come kind of a you know hypocrite you what are you are you really a met fan and my met, my sister is probably the most fanatical met fan i've ever known but she's really getting it now from you know simply suggesting that hey why don't we wait until the mets actually do something before we do the the the, the disco lights and the trumpets when uh edwin diaz comes in to uh relieve anyway enough with that and my sister why don't we take a look at the radar we'll start with uh, OKX, we'll start with the Upton radar. And you can see we've had our fair share uh, at uh, Putnam Valley. Here in Putnam Valley, Joe, we have had about two-thirds of an inch of rain. Still raining out there, but it looks like the back edge of the steadiest rain is getting ready now to cross through uh, from uh, New Jersey and across the Hudson Valley. So maybe in a few hours, uh, that rain will be pretty well done. Or if not done, at least we'll have some spritzes and sprinkles around but again the heaviest round of rain for today pretty much is now off to the east of our area if we go down a uh, little ways down to the south and take a look at uh, dover air force base uh, delaware and ellendale you could see that much of new jersey central and south jersey is out in the clear for the moment but uh, notice if you will in central maryland there's another round of steadier rain that's advancing or progressing to the east and in fact there's a pretty good area of heavy rain that just came through uh, the Washington Baltimore area and that will be uh, continuing eastward toward uh, the Delmarva Peninsula probably during the next uh, few hours and eventually reaching South Jersey again South and Central Jersey now kind of in a break in the precipitation for the moment uh, we'll go uh, up to the north and let's check out uh, uh, Albany Albany right now is showing uh, areas of light to occasional moderate rain. And again, most of the activity in eastern New York State is getting ready to cross the Hudson and move on into adjacent uh, western Massachusetts and western section of Connecticut. Appearing now over toward uh, the Binghamton area on the final few frames of the loop is a new wave of moisture. So this area here along and near the Hudson, you'll get a bit of a break in the next hour or two, but don't put away the umbrella because more of the wet stuff is on the way for later on in the night. Uh, further to the west, we that's where all the action is. 
let's uh let me pick a spot let's say in uh wilmington ohio and you can see there are some nasty cells that are crossing over uh from uh indiana into ohio and uh, there's, there's a i wouldn't call it a squall line but there is a very definite line of activity that extends from about columbus and central sections of ohio south and west into northernmost sections of kentucky and i believe right. Joe, go ahead i'm sorry i believe i believe that i believe down in here in this region that i'm outlining roughly with my uh, cursor that there are all kinds of uh, watches for uh, tornado activity due to some of these cells is that correct or uh, well we in uh, in ohio in adams and brown county and this is as of 7 51 p.m eastern time on the 2nd of april just in case you're watching this on a replay or overnight uh, every you know obviously everything we're doing is dated so be sure to go to weather.gov to get the latest information on severe weather because it will be going on through the night in some places uh, Adams and Brown County uh, in Ohio, uh, a severe thunderstorm capable of producing a tornado located near Manchester, moving east at 45. The storm previously produced a tornado and may generate another tornado at any time. And then we have a severe thunderstorm warning for Bracken, Lewis, Mason, Robertson, Adams, Brown, Pike, and uh, Scioto counties, if I'm pronouncing that right. If I'm not, I apologize. Uh, that covers both Kentucky and Ohio, so it's right down near the border. And this, if the severe thunderstorm was located along a line extending from near Seaman to 10 miles west of Fairview, mo moving east at 45. So, uh, yes, uh, as you said, uh, and you know, there are there are watches and warnings going on. I mean, there Jackson, are warnings going on. Jackson, Jackson, Kentucky slash Noctor uh, in Kentucky showing very active uh, radar across central and uh, eastern Kentucky and also adjacent areas of southern and southwestern Ohio. These are the storms that I think you were just talking about, Joe. And uh, some of this activity, uh, not so strong, moving into and uh, out of the range of the radar in uh, Jackson uh, over in West Virginia. So uh, there are quite a few strong cells of precipitation that are being tracked. Let me, I, a few moments ago, I had Indianapolis up. And here is Indianapolis. You see like a minor uh, squall line here that's uh, kind of fading. And there was one that went through, uh, looks like the Indianapolis area, uh, kind of a broken line of, uh, of uh, not necessarily strong storms, although they seem to uh, become regenerated once they passed Indianapolis. And uh, so th that's what's going on in Indianapolis. Uh, I'm looking down here. We'll go down to Kentucky again. A different part of Kentucky. This is Louisville, Kentucky, and you could see a, a a line of showers and strong storms again moving past Louisville and moving on into uh, uh, the uh, eastern sections of Kentucky. I've been to Louisville actually once, and uh, it was interesting. I remember when I was leaving Louisville and I got in the cab to go to the airport. the the uh, The guy who's driving the cab said. Uh, did you see everything here in beautiful Louisville? I said, I think so. He said, did you see the uh, the Bat Company? And you know, right down the block from where I was staying was the uh, Hillrich and Bradsby Louisville Bat Company where they make all the baseball bats. And I said, yeah, I, I didn't see it, but I, I, I know what you're talking about. He said, did you see Churchill Downs? And I said, no. He said, would you like to see Churchill Downs? I said, I don't know. Uh, how much of a diversion is it from here to the airport? He said, no, no, I'll take you there. Is there no extra charge? You have to see Churchill Downs. And I remember we passed right by Churchill Downs. But I said, that's where the Kentucky Derby is every year, first Saturday in May. He said, now, you know what? I said, why? He says, if this were the first Saturday in May, I couldn't get within 25 miles of right where we are right now. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I gave the guy a little extra money for the for the for the tour of Louisville. Interesting place. You ever get a chance to uh, to, to go there? Well, it's anyway. On my, it's on my list. Brandon yes. Doherty hit the tip jar. Thank you, Brandon, uh, for hitting Super Chat tonight. Um, can you um, unshare? Unshare? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll unshare? Yeah, now I've unshared. Yeah. You've yes. Un, you've unshared. Yes. Uh, excellent. Uh, okay, so I'm going to... I'm just going to get... Just going to do some things really quick here uh, from a technical standpoint. And, uh, and now and I'm you did break. think 
You did thank uh, Johnny Quest and Barry Goldberg for that. I did. Yes, I did. Yes, we um, always appreciate that. Thank you very much. And uh, we're up to sixty-one likes, which is which is which is fine. We like that. Joe, I, I, said, I don't understand. I don't understand what Brandon Doherty means on the chat board. He says, "Does Joe Rayo have a handle?" Do I, what what is uh, that? I, I think that's like, are you at? You know, are you known as Joe Rayo or Joe Rayo Weather or, you know, your ID? On, My ID. Your YouTube. Joe when Rayo. you're on, when you write on the chat board, what is you know comes up? Joe Rayo. Does it come up? Joe Rayo Weather. I think, Rayo it, comes up, I think, I think it comes up. Joe Rayo Weather. I'm just gonna say, I'll say hi. Yeah. Hi. I, I, just, I think it comes up as Joe Rayo. So where does it come up? I had Joe Rayo Weather. There you go, Joe Rayo Weather. All right. Hey, here's hey. here's here's what the radar looks like on the wide view. I mean, this is a pretty extra, you know, this is a pretty large system here. You've got a, the upper air circulation is back in Wisconsin, in, in in you know western part of Michigan, and you can see the rotation that swings around over the top from the upper peninsula down into Wisconsin. Now that's that's mostly snow that's going on there on the northwest side. And then, of course, you also see the extent of uh, the thunderstorms that continue down through uh, central Tennessee. There's a tornado warning uh, up uh, along the Alabama-Tennessee border that's about to expire. Uh, this is now coming up on 756 Eastern Time. And we've got some more developing cells to the south. Now, I'll be curious to see how this area that's down in central Alabama, how that evolves as it moves to the northeast. Because I'll be that's what I'll probably get into as we move through the overnight. And, you know, they're going to probably see another expanding area of uh, rain. By the way, we do have a, a large uh, one, two, three. I can't even count how many counties there are in this. But uh, much of southeastern Ohio right now is under a flash flood warning. Uh, you can see that big green box uh, that covers, uh, oh, God, almost a quarter of, well, not quite a quarter of the state. But, you know, maybe a fifth of the state or a sixth of the state under a, under a flash flood warning there. So very, very busy on the radar. Otherwise, you have to go to the northwest corner of Washington state to find anything because the western part of the United States is doing A-OK. -okay. And here's what it looks like on the satellite loop, which I'm going to give a quick refresh. And, uh, you know, the circulation with the upper low is well defined over the Great Lakes. Uh, it's pulling up moisture out of the Gulf of Mexico. Warm air is surging up the eastern seaboard. As I mentioned earlier, Joe, I was in the upper 70s today. Uh, right. Which, you know, which is part of this equation. You've got all this warm air that's moving up northward. And, you know, now, of course, that low and the surface low with this is going to die out. And you're going to see a new low reform the point of occlusion that's going to run from the, the, the Michigan low to, you know, down across uh, southern Pennsylvania to the, through the Delmarva Peninsula. So somewhere in there, you're going to have a low develop uh, overnight and tomorrow morning. That is going to be the primary driver for the rain and for the wind and for everything else, including the snow up in New England, uh, for tomorrow and tomorrow night in the Northeast. Yes, I'm just reading some of the... Uh comments on the chat board here and i want to thank leon probitsky for hitting uh super chats tonight thank you very much leon and uh joe this uh this pattern of uh of extremes that we are seeing over recent days very unusual for the early part of april although not unknown we certainly remember uh, many of us on the chat board i'm sure remember april 6 1982 the famous blizzard that hit the New York tri-state area with New York getting just under 10 inches of snow. And there was also a storm that hit on April Fool's Day in 1997. That storm didn't bring very much to New York City, but places uh, north of Interstate 287 got walloped with anywhere from 6 to as much as uh, 18 inches of snow, heavy, wet snow, which brought down a lot of trees, a lot of power lines. And I know that there are many people who remember that storm, not so much for the snow, but also because of the power outages that were very long lasting. It took a long time to get power back to those places that were out without power because of all the heavy wet snow that fell again on April Fool's Day, 1997. So if you look at that, that's like a 15, every 15 years or so, It uh, if you go by that timeline, which means that uh, for us, well, it's it's kind of, it's, uh, we, we were about due to get some kind of a significant or major uh, event here in the Northeast. Once again, 
looks more rainy than anything else for New York and for the immediate lower Hudson Valley region. But uh, in places up to the north, especially north of 84, up into the Catskills, and especially so, let's say, north of Albany, they could be looking at uh, upwards to, well, uh, maybe Joe will look at it in a moment from WPC standpoint, maybe as much as a foot or more of snow out of all of this. Not bad for the first week of April, Joe. Oh, not at all. Skiers are happy for sure. Uh, WPC's rainfall forecast. Now, bear in mind that, um, I'm sorry, I have to look. I got to see this. Um, what? No, there's somebody posted up a message. Oh, you deleted it. I always love to to see, you know, when you get these idiots that come on the chat board that are, are there just to post stupid messages. Thank you, Johnny Quest, for eliminating it. But, you know, I'm 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 like the guy, the, the car going eastbound that slows down to watch the accident on the westbound side. So when I see that, I gotta I can uncheck it so I can see what they wrote. They didn't Tom, write it. Yeah, Tom Contino on the chat board is asking me what were the forecasts like for 1982. Were we ready for it? And I will say this, Tom: everybody was ready for it except for one famed weathercaster in the New York metropolitan area who no longer is on television, by the way, but was the son of a legendary forecaster on another channel. Uh, while everybody else was calling for uh, near blizzard or possible blizzard conditions and big heavy snowfall amounts, this one guy uh, came in front of the camera and gave his reasonings as to why we were not going to get a significant amount of snow. The night before, in fact, literally hours before the first uh, bit of precipitation began to fall, he showed us the local readings and he said, look at that, it's much too warm for snow. It's 42 degrees right now. This was on the 11 o'clock report. He said, and now you need humidity, you need moisture. Look at the relative humidity right now. It's down to like 25%. And look at the winds. The winds are blowing out of a northerly direction at only 10 miles an hour. You'd want winds from the east to bring in moisture. And then after all of that, going through all that, he said we would get less than two inches of snow. And uh, needless to say, he had a lot of, as, as, as Ricky Ricardo would say, he had a lot of splaining to do. I mean, the, the, Joe, the, the funny thing was also, he pointed out, look at the radar. I can tell you right now on the radar, just off to the west of New York City, it's raining. So how are we going to get all that snow if, we're, if it's raining? Well, of course, naturally, when it started raining in New York, the temperature fell rapidly because of evaporational cooling, because of the air was so dry. And so the, the, the rain went within an hour or two to mostly snow, and then we're off to the ball game we were. And the next morning, not only were we getting snow, but we were also getting thunder and lightning and heavy snow and gusty winds and whatever else. And, you know, needless to say, that one weathercaster, the only one, I might add, even his father had predicted a major snowfall. I mean, you know, you talk about, you know, trying to be the one to, to make to make the headlines by being the only one to forecast no big storm. Uh, he kind of slinked away off into the uh, off into the darkness uh, after that. So. So that's how they that's how they that's how we did it. That's how people did in the storm of 82, Tom. Everybody was pretty much on target except for one person. Okay. And his name is not being mentioned because we like to protect the the in a, the uh, living. Only Probably. the names have been only the names right. have been changed, only the names have been changed on this program to protect the innocent and the incompetent. Right. WPC <laughs> WPC. Um, this is my way. This, this is my way of getting back at this 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 jerk. By the way, because there was a there was a time that my my weather company, the company I, I was hold working, on. Let me put you back full screen. I, I have like to it. do. This hold is my on. way of getting back at this guy. Well, you know, you have you know you listen. Everybody has their gas bag. You have <laughs> your you have your gas bag. I have my gas bag. I have pontificated on my gas bag. Now you can pontificate on yours. I'm just going to step away to get a glass of water. My room's on fire. Oh, <laughs> oh such a pinch. Contino's, okay. getting, Contino's getting excited. Rant coming. Incoming rant. <laughs> All right. Now, th th this, I was working for a private weather forecasting service, which before AccuWeather took over, at this television station in New York, 
we, our station, our weather office was doing the weather for this TV station, this TV outlet, and this person uh, was on the uh, evening and nighttime uh, shows. And uh, it was a storm system coming up. Everybody was talking about the possibility. It was in December of 1989, and everybody was talking about the possibility of a major snowfall, okay? Major snowfall coming, and uh, uh, we sent out our forecast to the channel in question. And then just about an hour before the show, the television uh, news was going on, I plotted up a map, and I noticed that it was getting milder down over South Jersey and along the coast. And I was concerned that there was some kind of a coastal front that was developing. So instead of going 6 to 12 inches on the original forecast, I lowered the accumulations. I said instead of 6 to 12, I was going 3 to 6. And I explained. I said I'm concerned that warmer air is going to get interacted and that we're going to see lower snow amounts. And when I watched the show uh, about an hour and a half later, this guy... <laughs> I'm not going to use any adjectives to describe what I think about this person or thought about him. Not only did he not go with the 6 to 12, he upped it for whatever reason. He went for like 8 to 14 inches. Well, I was furious because, again, I had lowered it. I had halved it to 3 to 6. And I called up the, his, his intern, the guy who he worked with, and he said uh, he made a reference to, the, to the, my weather company. My weather, The company I worked for was called CompuWeather, and this, this person, this... Uh, uh, <laughs> the guy thought he was like the greatest thing about weather forecasting since sliced bread. He called our company incompetent weather. He said, I can't believe that incompetent weather is calling for three to six inches when it's so obvious it's going to be a major snowfall with as much as uh, eight to 12 or eight to 14. And that's why he upped it. And he said, he just took your forecast, Joe, and threw it in the circular file. Well, anyway, I have to admit something right here and now, Joe. I have to admit I was wrong. I was indeed wrong. I said in my updated forecast, New York was going to get three to six inches because I was concerned about a coastal front coming in and bring in milder air. I was wrong. You know what? No snow fell. There was absolutely everything changed over to rain before it even got to New York. And there was not a flake, not an ice pellet, as you would say, nothing. It was a, and it was a tremendous bust. Everybody was screaming, you know, the weather forecasters don't know anything or whatever like that. And, and meanwhile, the one who ended up with the biggest bust was the jerk at the TV station that we were servicing who decided he wasn't going to go with my forecast. He decided to up his to like 8 to 14, making it more than anybody else. <laughs> and I mean, like I said, I, and, and the funny thing is, I, I called this guy up and left like three re recorded messages on his answering machine at the weather office. And I said, gee, you know. It's a sure, it sure is a good thing that at least we lowered our accumulations to three to six, isn't it? Because that warm air came in much more strongly than we had anticipated. And I, I hung the phone up in like 10 minutes. I said, boy, we're, we're going we're gonna to look really good with this, right? And, you know, just absolutely, you know, anyway, that's, 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 my, that's my, my rant for the evening about my memory of that. Uh, it touched touch me off on that April 80, 82 storm uh, and uh, other systems that he uh, – uh, you know, Tom Contino was he a degreed meteorologist? He took a few courses at McGill University in Montreal. That was his extent of meteorological expertise. And it always helps to have a father who's big in the TV industry and who can, through the degree of nepotism, get you any job that you want. <laughs> Do the math, folks. Rant over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. The folks at WPC, who we know watch this show almost religiously, um, have been just patiently waiting for my description of the WPC rainfall forecast map, uh, and here it is. So, um, remember, we've already picked up I don't know, anywhere between a half inch and three quarters of an inch of rain with what happened, you know, over today, overnight and today. So, this is on top of what's already fallen. So another inch and a half to two and a half inches possible across Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Long Island, southern and southeastern New England, and then on up the coast through eastern New England. Also, a big precip amounts uh, in western New York over Lake Ontario and on the Canada side uh, between Lake Huron and the St. Lawrence River, um, also showing uh, an ample amount of rain being forecast there. 
Amounts tail off a bit as you head down through Virginia. They tail off a bit more. Half to three-quarter inch rainfall. So this is seven day, by the way. Um, most of what you see in the northeast and, and the northern mid-Atlantic states is from this particular storm and then not much after that. Um, uh, the south, uh, uh, half to three-quarter inch, a couple of pockets of one inch, uh, depending on convection. Uh, also, we see... Um, for a later system in Oklahoma and Arkansas and East Texas and Louisiana, uh, three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half plus there. Uh, on up through the northern Rockies, where we see liquid appreciative amounts of uh, an inch and a half or more, particularly in central and northern Idaho and parts of northwestern Montana, and half inch to some inch and a half pockets in uh, Washington and the Cascades and down uh, into the uh, into the Sierra Nevadas. Now, as far as the snow is concerned, this is WPC's probability of at least two. And I just brought this up first because of the fact that, you know, I like to use that 50% line. And if you, and that's that, not the darkest blue, but the next shade up from that, slightly lighter. Uh, so that goes across northern Pennsylvania uh, through, I would probably say, um, uh, it's uh, Sullivan County, then kind of turns northward into northwestern Connecticut, and then you know extends along the Massachusetts state line and goes west of Boston. So that, to me, I guess kind of makes sense. In case there was anyone thinking that this stuff was going to wind up further south, it's just it's not going to happen. But you can see where I've got the um, you know where I drew that in. So it's from there north that we have a chance for accumulating snows, and that includes the Catskills and especially up in northern New York in the Adirondacks, all of Vermont, New Hampshire, and into Maine, uh, on almost near 100% probability. We're going to jump to eight uh, for the bigger amounts, and uh, you see where that sets up, and that's mostly, that's all north of I-90, covering uh, the Adirondacks into northeastern New York. So again, once again, it's going to be up the north way on 87, Lens Falls, Saratoga to Plattsburgh, um, most of Vermont, most of New Hampshire, 80% uh, or higher probability for at least eight, and a good chunk of the state of Maine with a high probability of at least uh, eight inches. And uh, back in Wisconsin, we're seeing an area of 50% uh, or higher for at least eight uh, in the inland away from Lake Michigan and going up into the Upper Peninsula, where we've got uh, a bullseye there of 95% for at least uh, eight inches and just widen out to take a look in the west uh, coming into the zone. This is, by the way, through Friday night. You have some areas here in the Cascades and in the Sierra Nevadas where we're seeing high probabilities for at least eight inches. All right, um, let's, look at the, let's look at the upper air. Let's see what's going on. And, yeah. If, in fact, I'm going to go use the North America view. We've got, I mean, this would have actually, Joe, could have worked out. If, if we had had a decent winter, okay, and what I mean by that is from the standpoint of the, of the quality of cold air, which was so lacking, in, especially in Canada, this might actually have turned, you know, if the atmosphere over the winter months had been so much colder that, we would we would still see uh, remnants of those cold air masses uh, in the Northeast. This system probably could have been uh, a, another, you know, a, a system that would have brought snow down even to the coast. You have a block up, in, you know, you have a Greenland block set up, uh, you and a strong short wave that drops down from Northwest Canada makes this cutoff low, and, and this thing really just wraps up like an animal. Uh, over uh, northern Indiana. The problem is that we didn't, first of all, we didn't have that cold air. Um, but you know, this upper low, it, it just it, if it had dug down further south, and say it's, instead of being up in northern Indiana, uh, if it had dug down to southern Indiana or into Kentucky, for example, and then pivoted east from there, we could have had probably a very interesting situation along the coast. But instead, we're getting this you know, big rain event, the big wind event. The upper low is going to track across Ohio and Pennsylvania and move, you know, into northeast Pennsylvania, southern New York by the time we get to Thursday night, and then just spin around for a while during Friday into Saturday. So this is going to prolong doom and gloom conditions 
Um, and it's also going to keep things pretty cold, pretty chilly for the rest of the week and into the weekend. But you could see what I'm, you know, with the upper low tracking the way it is, and you want to use, you know, I always like to use the rule, you look at the upper low track and you go about 50 to 120 miles north and west of where the upper low tracks, uh, that that pretty much tells you where the heavy snow is going to be, which is where all the winter storm warnings are up. Uh, northern New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. I mean, this is um, this works almost all the time. Well, Plattsburgh, where uh, uh, many are uh, planning to be for the eclipse next Monday, may, may be a problem getting up there. Well, you know, there, Plattsburgh is right off of Interstate 87. It's an, it's, a, it's an interstate road. So if they do get, let's say, a foot to a foot and a half of snow by, let's say, Thursday or Thursday night, my assumption would be that uh, most of the main roads and thoroughfares up there will be pretty well plowed or cleared away by next Monday for those who are coming up to see the uh, see the solar eclipse. But just to even say a foot to a foot and a half of snow in the first week of April is something, even if you're up in the Plattsburgh area, up in the Adirondacks. And actually, you know, Joe, the uh, Plattsburgh is uh, right at the base of uh, a major ridge, a mountain ridge. I mean, Mount Marcy, the tallest mountain in New York State, 5,300 feet plus, is just a stone's throw away to the west and south. I mean, I, I would suppose if you're up on Mount, Mount Marcy, you'd probably be talking about maybe two to three feet of snow out of this impending uh, system coming coming in. And you're right about the, the cold air. It is marginally cold. I mean, it's not, you know, the kind of snow that's going to, you know, not the kind of cold air with temperatures, you know, down in the 20s and the powdery, puffy type of snow. This is going to be kind of a, a heavy, sloppy, slushy, wet snow for... It's, uh, it's, a, it's a top down. It's dynamic yeah. cooling with the upper. It's all the upper low. It's so it's such a powerful upper low that it more than compensates for the lack of any kind of real Arctic air. Correct. Correct. And you know that happened. You know that that was that, that worked in 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 our area in mid February when we got our snowfall, our two snowfalls in February. Right. Uh, it was b borderline cold air, but you know we had an upper low involved, and that was just enough to you know create some do-it-yourself cold air and we got what we got uh but the block here is going to break down after we go through this weekend uh and then the upper low is going to pull out we just kind of get there's another system that's coming into california that gets kicked to the east uh sunday and monday uh and by monday morning there's an upper low in wisconsin but it looks like there's just enough ridging between the old storm, which is the old upper air storm, which is south of Newfoundland and this, this system to the west, that the weather should be okay for you. We certainly got our fingers crossed to that with regards to the eclipse. And I'll bring up the eclipse map. I have that ready to go in just a second. But overall, in terms of the pattern uh, going into next week, we still have short waves running around and we still, you know, it's still kind of messy. And, it, and troughs are going to try to come into the eastern part of the United States. Um, it does, you know, it stays pretty active right through the next couple of weeks. So we'll have more weather systems to be playing around with here uh, going forward. So here's the, the uh, surface. Let's get the surface map going. There's your low uh, this evening uh, sitting right in Lake Michigan between uh, Grand Rapids on one side, and Chicago on the other. That low just, you know, basically reflects the upper low. It's just rotating on itself. Uh, a new low forms on the point of occlusion, and you know what I mean by that is when you you know draw the you know draw the fronts on this map, it kind of looks like this, and there's a warm front here. So right at that point where the cold front, the warm front, and the occluded front meet, um, we call that the point of occlusion, and that's where you're going to see your surface low redevelop. And you can see the gradient, by the way, during the day tomorrow is really really tight. From southern New Jersey to southern to southeastern New England, a lot of isobars in there with that low that goes right over Delaware Bay and then passes off the central New Jersey coast south of Long Island. You see the snow in upstate New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. That dark blue heavy snow shows up uh, tomorrow uh, tomorrow night into Thursday morning. You know that's a you know that's a big plus for the snow lovers up there, Joe, because of the fact that the heaviest snow is going to fall at night, so it does help the cause for them. Uh, the low just reaches its max intensity, then just rotates around with the upper low, 
Uh, we still have cold, unstable air around for Thursday, so there could be some showers around. Uh, same for Friday, some snow showers in inland areas, and even some lingering stuff into Saturday morning, but then it finally starts to pull away. Sunday looks good, and as long as this low coming out of Colorado doesn't decide to become anything more important, uh, this is at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Monday with the high in Canada and a high off the North Carolina coast. Uh, if you look at the, I've got, this is the GFS 18Z, Joe, the satellite, the cloud cover map, and over, you know, no, much of northern New York, except for that area up near the mountains where it's showing some cloud cover, uh, it it, it uh, doesn't really show much of anything. I mean, it shows mostly clear skies across uh, northern Vermont, northernmost New Hampshire, and into Maine, and then you have to go really, it's got this little arm of clouds from, um, Buffalo and Rochester, southwest to northwest New Jersey. Uh, coverage is about 47% in that gray and blue area. And then it, in the in the bright blue, you know, back up into northern Michigan, you see it there. It's 100%. Uh, so if you're in Cleveland, you're not going to be happy about this um, or anywhere in Ohio for that matter. Uh, but so far, so good for you. Well, up here, you could see here and also in southern Vermont. Well, that's outside of the totality path. But up here, you say, the, what the heck is that? Because Plattsburgh really is right adjacent to that. That is probably uh, convective cumulus activity. The clouds bubbling up in the midday and afternoon. And you say to yourself, well, that's not good. The eclipse is going to be at 325 in the Plattsburgh area. But this is one of those occasions when the eclipse may actually help to control the weather. We have seen this at other eclipses, and that is, is that when uh, the sun becomes gradually covered by the moon, and it will take 75 minutes from the start of the eclipse to totality, what happens is the temperatures drop, and these convective, these cumulus clouds, begin to react to the drop in the temperature by beginning to dissipate. It's like the, uh, the, the late afternoon for them all of a sudden. It's like we're approaching sunset. It's time for us to uh, dry up and dissipate. And that has happened at other eclipses. So I, I look at that and I say, well, it doesn't look good. But And, and, and the one thing about the uh, models is that the computer models don't know that there's a total eclipse of the sun coming. They're just doing you know, their normal stuff based upon the algorithms and the calculations and equations that are built into the various uh, 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 computer models. They don't know that there's going to be an eclipse that's going to suddenly drop temperatures maybe as much as uh, 4 to 8 or 5 to 10 degrees in a span of an hour's time. And, of course, you get that. You, that's definitely going to have a say in what kind of cloud cover. That's not going to affect, if, for the places that you pointed out uh, to the west and south, like toward Cleveland or that arm of high clouds that seems to be over the Rochester area to uh, northwest Jersey, That uh, those high clouds are not affected by the uh, eclipse with the temperature dropping. Those clouds will pretty much remain in place, but the lower clouds, the, the cumulus uh, clouds, which are activated by sunlight, and sometimes we refer to that here on Joe and Joe as you know self-destruct sunshine. Well, yeah, the sun, the, the, the sun may actually cause the clouds to form for a while, but uh, if we do get those convective clouds later in the day, the eclipse will hopefully do its job and erase them from the sky before the uh, the peak of the eclipse at 325 that afternoon. And I got the whole U.S. map up. So actually, and I, uh, the white is the, where skies are mostly clear, and the blue is where we have cloud cover. That's I, funny. I, I said like yesterday they should have reversed it because that's that – your my mind went immediately to what a satellite loop picture looks like, okay? So if I just switch over just for, you know, you look at a loop, the clouds are white, okay? Uh, uh, they decided to take the reverse colors. I don't know why. So if you see your area on the map in white, that means it's probably clear or mostly clear. If you see your area on the U.S. in blue, like, for example, in Texas, all of Texas is under 100% cloud cover. This whole path of totality here through Mexico uh, into Texas, uh, and then it you know, opens up a little bit when you get into Arkansas, a small area in Arkansas, southern Missouri, and southern Illinois, where the cloud cover goes down to under 25%. Then it goes back to 100% when you get into Indiana and Ohio. Then it goes back down as you head into western New York, except for that arm that cuts across uh, from Buffalo to Rochester down to Scranton. Uh, 
Uh, and then you go on the other side of that, and we're talking minimal to no cloud cover at all. So I know, Vincent Croce, you were talking about asking about Brooklyn. If you look at the GFS, if I put the cursor, it's got a 34%, 34% cloud cover there. But if you go over to Islip, it's got 3%. So it's literally a stick of clouds. I mean, if the people are... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Joe. I was just going to add... But it's the model, so and we're still. This is 144 hours out, so uh, it'll 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 smooth out some more as we get closer. Absolutely, and in fact, this system that's moving through right now, when it gets offshore, it could very well intensify more than what the models. It could overperform more than what the models are suggesting now, and an, and that would be good because an overperforming storm, let's say a, a storm that really is. Uh, uh, already a, it's indication of, uh, of cutting off, but I mean, a stronger storm would actually set up more of a block. And so those clouds, those high clouds that are coming in from that next disturbance from uh, Wisconsin and the Great Lakes will just slow down. And uh, uh, hopefully they'll stay out of the area. And uh, people who are currently looking at the, the chance for an, a high and mid-level overcast, maybe it'll be a bit better, again, because of the storm. Everything is connected to each other, Joe, and we have to wait we really would have to wait now for this system to get out over the ocean and do its thing, uh, and then we'll have a much better. And of course, as we've always said, when you're within 72 to 84 hours of a, of the day of, of of interest, that's when you're going to really know what you're going to see. We're still at 140, 150 hours out, so there's still some wiggle room for changing uh, the uh, the forecast somewhat. And uh, uh, and J. Justin B. on the chat board, who cares about the traffic jams? It's a total eclipse. And I agree with that. I mean, there are people that they say, well, you know, I may be stuck in traffic for many hours after the eclipse or trying to get into the zone before the eclipse. But heck, if you know what you're hoping to see, uh, this incredible sight of a total eclipse of the sun, uh, it is worth being in traffic for, uh, for a bit, for a little while. Maybe not eight or 12 hours. I wouldn't like to go through that, but, um, it's uh, and I and, and Joe, you've uh, I've, I've told you on every electronic sign here in New York State, yes, every electronic I, sign they're they're like warning you like it's the second coming of the apocalypse of uh, eclipse on oh, April the eighth. Stay early, st leave late. You know that's it's it's like it's like crazy. So <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, you need to ring the bell because we have 111 likes tonight. Oh well, okay. My 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 thing doesn't work. It's always, it says ninety four, but I'm sure now that if I exit out and come back in again, I'll be at that uh, number that you just said. And by the way, for those of you who are, if you're having trouble finding this free solar glasses, if you check your local libraries, but if they've run out and you need to purchase, uh, I did put links up. Uh, they're in the on the lower left hand corner of the video. Uh, to Walmart, where they they're selling a few things, and um, including one that if you want to use your smartphone in order to see the eclipse. Uh, so, you know, take a look at that uh, if you'd like. Just want to put Frank Scalera. Frank Scalera is asking, and with the eclipse, will it go dark like when the sun is setting or rising? If you are in the zone of totality, Frank, thirty seconds before totality, it will be the equivalent of, of uh, the sky 20 minutes before sunset. When you suddenly are plunged into totality, it goes from that to 40 minutes after sunset. The darkening effect is just downright frightening, and you can understand why the ancient peoples were scared out of you, their you-know-whats when a total eclipse took place. Uh, in that rapid, and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, the approach of the shadow, Joe, the approach of the moon shadow from the west and southwest, like two minutes before totality, you're looking in the west-southwest, it looks like a time-lapse of a, of a darkening, growing cumulonimbus cloud. And it, it's just rushing towards you at about two or 3,000 miles per hour, and it just envelops you. It's like, a, like somebody's throwing a blanket over your head. It is, it's, 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 it's one that you, something that you really have to see, and one that uh, uh, it, it's a, it's, I've been saying this over and over and over again, trying to convince people to stay uh, out of, to get out of the partial zone and get into the total zone. Uh, Frank also wants to know what time will the eclipse happen in Monday in New York City. I know I can tell you the peak of the eclipse is at 325 on Monday. The eclipse starts at 210. 75 minutes later, it reaches its peak at 325. This, in New York, 91% of the sun's diameter will be covered 
by the moon. And if you're wondering how much darker it will be then, I've been telling, the analogy is for that, get, get a flashlight. And in the flashlight, you put in brand new alkaline batteries, brand new, and then shine it in somebody's face. And they go, oh, my God, oh, because a brand new battery or batteries will make the light shine brilliantly white and almost blindingly white. Now, take those batteries out and put a uh, put batteries in that are already more than half used. You turn the light on, the light will take a second or two to come on. It will provide you with enough light if you're in the dark to see something, but it'll be a much yellower light, a much dimmer light, a much weaker light, as opposed to having, uh, you know, full, full power, full charge with, a, with, a, with, with brand new batteries. That's kind of like what it'll be in New York at 325 next Monday. You'll step outside. If it's a bright and sunny day, you're going to say to yourself, well, it looks, it's sunny. I don't see very many clouds, but it, it doesn't seem right because the sun, the sun doesn't seem to be putting out as much uh, as it normally would on a bright, sunny day. And that would be a function of the, of the, uh, of the 91% eclipse. But you will not be able to see stars and planets popping out. You will not see uh, the beautiful colorations that are around the horizon during a total eclipse. You will not be able to see the corona suddenly flash into view at the moment of total eclipse with the diamond ring effect. None of those will be visible from New York, and you'll always have to keep your glasses on because even 91% is enough if you stare at it long enough without any uh, protection to cause partial or complete blindness. So that's that's the story. You either It's like... Joe, uh, again, the, uh, the analogy here, uh, like going to the Super Bowl. You go to the Super Bowl and you, you don't have a ticket. You go into the parking lot and you, you know, enjoy yourself with the other people parking their cars, maybe have a, enjoy a couple of hot dogs at a tailgate party. But when the game begins, everybody goes into the stadium. You're left outside all by yourself. The people in the stadium get a chance to see the game, interact with each other, have fun at a, at a memorable time. You're out in the parking lot. And you're pretty much all by yourself. That's what being in the partial eclipse zone is like. You want to get a ticket to the Super Bowl. You want to get into that totality path next Monday so that you can experience a bucket list event, a once in a lifetime event for many, a total eclipse of the sun. All right. And now, having said that, I throw it back to Joe. <laughs> and and uh, let's do Briller Jeopardy, shall we? Yes, surely. Uh, so it's at weather extremes in New York City uh, is the category tonight. What was the highest temperature ever in Central Park in the month of April? Oh, I'm sh- um, was it? And I think actually we tied it. Uh, 96 degrees. I know one of the dates, April 18th, 1976. It was actually Easter Sunday, but I believe uh, sometime later, we actually tied that 96 degree temperature. Is that is, is that, that correct? That is correct. Uh, 96. Um, uh, so you were right about the Easter Sunday, and it was April 17th, 2002, when right. we got to 96. So I see everybody on the chat boards popping up numbers. Uh, Chuck Cardillo nailing the 96, which is great. Uh, next question. What was the lowest temperature ever recorded in the month of April? Oh, dear. Oh, the lowest temperature. I'll bet you it was single digits. I'll I'll say I'll say nine degrees. I don't know the date, but I'll just I'll just say nine degrees. You'll say nine. Um okay. Uh let's see. All Star 10 says 15. Vincent Croce says 16. J. Justin B says 13. Snake Country for you. Uh so you're close. Mike Waterhouse, 17. Frank Scalera, 18. Chuck Cardillo and Izzy D say 11. Snake Country, so you know what that means. If it's not 13 and it's not 11, it's Patrick Darcy at 12. Yeah. 12, Joe, on April. It never got, it's never been in the single digits in April. Uh, 12 degrees, April 1st, 1923. Okay. okay. Now, wow. the coldest daytime high ah. in April. And you should know this. I should, shouldn't I? Yes, you it was should. Right after, it, was, it was probably the day after the April 6th blizzard, right? 33? Um, well, you're in the right time frame. Your temperature's a little off. Um, 33, uh, 34, you know. Um, hmm. Everybody still posted. Izzy D says 31. That's close. Tim Gore, Gora, 24. You're too low. Uh, Chuck Cardillo, 31. You're close. 
Mike Waterhouse and John Melander, you're close from the other side. So if it's not 29 and it's not 31, the answer is? 20? 30, April 7th, 1982. Mm-hmm. So I think that was the day of the storm. No, April. it was April 6th. April 6th, so it was the next day. The snow, the snow tapered off and ended late on the night of the 6th. But the, Okay, I, so, so it was the next day. So it was 30. Barely got out of the 20s in, in in New York City. So you know the inland areas didn't get out of the 20s. Yeah, it, it was it was astonishing to me that it, it was so cold. And that was, not, and that was not just that day, the 7th. That cold stayed with us through, I think, the 8th and even the 9th. It was ridiculously cold. And as I said yesterday, a lot of people, when they when they talk about a big snowstorm late, oh, if it snows heavy in, in, in March, late March, or even early April, it's gone within a day. No. That April 6th blizzard, that snow was here a long time because that cold really preserved that snow. As I said, the Yankees were supposed to have opening day on April the 6th. It was a Tuesday, uh, and they never got that game played until April the 11th, Easter Sunday, five days later. And P.S., they played the White Sox, and P.P.S. for all of you Yankee fans, it was an opening day doubleheader, and the Yankees lost both games. What uh, the most snow for the month of April in Central Park, and all I'll just say is that um, the snowiest April month uh, produced more snow uh, than the last two winters have. Okay. The snowiest April. The snowiest April as, as for a month, right? I mean, it's not the snowiest snow fall in April. Right, the whole monthly total for the, 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 the total for the whole month. Hmm. I wish I knew. Um, I don't. I um, if if it whatever happened, it must have happened like maybe in the late nineteenth century, or not in the twentieth century, right? And I would say uh, the amount of snow that fell in April, the most snow was what about ten, ten or eleven inches. Oh, I is that the, is that your guess? Yes, that's my For the guess. whole month, a ten or eleven. Right. Which one? Eleven. Eleven. Okay. Um, Frank R. Um, if we round it off, you guessed it. Uh, Frank R. said fourteen. Uh, it's thirteen point five. So I'll give it to you. If you said thirteen or fourteen, uh, you've got the, the William Uber also said fourteen. So you got it. And the latest. Uh, the bonus question is the date for the latest measurable snow uh, at Central Park. Measurable snow? Well, that means not a trace. Right. Which, the latest measurable snow. How about April 23rd? April 23rd. Um, close. Close. Yes, tax day. Exactly. The government took a third of the snowfall. Um no, the April is a not May. April, the latest measurable snow for Central Park uh, is an April date. It's actually in 1875, the same year we got the 13.5 for the month. It was April 29th, April uh, 1875. A half an inch fell on that day. Half an inch. I see. I got. In fact, I just found a. An almanac here that uh, April April twenty fifth, eighteen seventy five saw New York City's latest measurable snowfall more than a trace when three inches fell. The New York Times called it quote a touch of winter in the heart of spring, and it was also the snowiest April on record with thirteen point five inches. Bye bye. Exactly. Yes. All right. So uh, the Joe and Joe Weather Show tonight brought to you by Tempest by Weatherflow. Get the revolutionary Tempest weather system. Join the fastest growing observing weather network on the planet. Links on the description of this podcast. Coupon code WINTER2324 for anything you purchase. If you use it, you will get 10% off. And don't worry, folks, this winter will eventually end and we'll have a brand new code for you. But in the moment, it's still most definitely winter here in the Northeast. All right. And. Um... Thanks. You have the tip, the super jar, the super te- super chat didn't take tip a jar note. list. I didn't take a note tonight. I know it was Johnny Quest. Johnny Quest, Barry Goldberg. 
Brandon Doherty and, 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 and Leon Probitsky, I think, were the four. Yes, um, they're the I think we got them all. Let me see if my viewer activity comes out. Yes, I my memory is actually working. Walking five miles a day has improved my brain. Uh, <laughs> so, that, so that's good. All right. Um, so everybody, tomorrow night we're at 830. And this will be the last time. Although we do have to think of what we're going to do on Monday, Joe. Monday, yeah, I'll tell you what, what what's probably likely going to be. On Monday... I'm probably going to be stuck somewhere on Interstate 87 trying to come home. So I may not be available on Monday for, for Joe and Joe, as that is uh, the day of the eclipse. And the same holds true for Sunday, because Sunday I'll be on Interstate 87 going north. <laughs> Unless I could figure out a way to – maybe I could do it from the car. <laughs> are you taking Are you taking your laptop with you? Yes, I am. Well, I mean, are you going to get to the hotel like in the afternoon? I, hope, I do hope we're going to get to the – hotel you know by later in All the right. day well, if, if you feel up to it you know you get you get to the hotel uh, yeah, well most you know, definitely just... if we're if we're there you know in the evening uh around joe and joe time i certainly will uh will uh log on and uh, we can do it uh um it, it, it everything is everything is uncertain because kathy hochel decided to scare the hell out of everybody with the uh highway signs and uh whether people are going to be on the road trying to get to the apop apop Ecalyptic eclipse, or whether or not they're all going to stay home because they're scared out of their socks that something's going to happen. I don't know, but we'll we'll play it by ear. All right. Okay, we'll talk about this um, off camera, and everybody else. We'll see you tomorrow night at eight thirty p.m. Eastern time. Good night. Good night, folks.